Our next two panels of the day, our last two panels of the day, are going to focus on where we can help women find the money. We've broken the conversation into two parts. Our next session is going to focus on sources of seed funding, and the final panel is going to focus on venture capital. In both, our panelists are going to consider how to get more female founders on funders' radar and through their pipeline. And I just want to announce for those of you who don't know, uh, one possible source of seed funding uh, could be a new fund called the Howard G. Buffett Fund for Women Journalists that the IWMF will be administering for the next 10 years. Uh, we're going to be giving away $230,000 a year, and we hope that many of you will come to us with your incredible ideas. Leading this next panel is Dr. Michelle Ferrier, an Associate Dean of Innovation Research Creati Creative Activity and Graduate Studies at Ohio University Scripps College of Communications. Welcome and thank you. Great, thank you. Um, it's really great, as many other people have already said, it is just wonderful to be able to look out in this room and see all of the amazing women, some of who I've met on Facebook and connected with, who have been doing this kind of work and really battling it out, doing what I call the art of the hustle in terms of getting your ventures off the ground and doing the work. And I think the panel that we've got right now is a really important panel to really focus on how we can get more visibility and get money to be able to persist in the work that we've started doing. Um, while I'm currently in academe, I have been an entrepreneur at a newspaper where I've developed online communities and I've also been an entrepreneur as well. And so I come to this panel with questions uh, based on some of my own experience as well as people that I've mentored through the new U Unity program and others about how to get their ventures off the ground. We've got a fabulous panel of folks here that I'm going to introduce you to that will help us answer some of those questions. Uh, to my immediate left, I've got Jake Shapiro, who's the founding partner of Matter Ventures and CEO of PRX Inc. Uh, we also have a switch in our uh, schedule. We have Marie Gillot, who is the program officer for journalism at the Knight Foundation. To her left, we have Deborah Jackson, who's the founder and CEO of Plum Alley Angels. And on our far left there, we have Christy George, who's the director of New Media Ventures. And so my first question, I'd like really for um, you all to begin by starting out and just helping us understand your approach to funding at your organization and then specifically what you do to help women founders. So if we start from the end and come this direction, that'll be great. Sure. Thanks everyone for having me. I'm really inspired um, by the morning um, and excited to get into this conversation about money. So uh, New Media Ventures. Uh, started uh, three or four years ago, so we think of ourselves as sort of an infant in the funding world, and we try to bring the best of the venture capital world and uh, the foundation world to bear on the startup space. So we fund at the seed level. Um, we fund both nonprofit and for-profit media and technology companies and organizations that create progressive political change. And uh, we do that um, in a funding range of 50,000 to a million dollars in grants, equity, debt, financing. Um, and we've got a couple of new programs that we've started most recently, the New Media Ventures Innovation Fund, which is an open call process. So we'll take a look at anything that fits into an early stage $50,000 level uh, grant and investment for, um, for startups. This round is on for-profit startups. And in fact, we've met a couple of uh, entrepreneurs here who've applied for the fund. Um, in terms of what we do to support women entrepreneurs, one of the things we're very proud of in the context of a technology portfolio is that our portfolio um, had been 50% women. Um, interestingly, most of the women entrepreneurs were actually running nonprofit startups. So it's a finding that Echo and Green also found in their cohort of fellows as well. Um, it's something that we're thinking about and we found that the way to address that issue was around being really proactive in getting people to apply to new media ventures. So it is always true that we would take a look at anything, but in terms of our own networks, the things that tended to come to us, either via other investors, other colleagues as funders, or entrepreneurs that we've funded before, did tend to be men. And so in the open call, what we did was aggressively market uh, toward uh, you know, women technology listservs, communities that brought together women entrepreneurs, 
we, sent, we kind of took a page from um, the Knight Mozilla Fellowships. There's a great post by one of their staffers about what they did to uh, increase the diversity of their applicants. I'd encourage all of you to read it. Um, and we basically sort of tried to follow that step by step. We, um, you know, we're still not there yet. I'd say we do less well on racial and ethnic diversity than I'd like, um, but I think being really proactive about meeting people where they're at and encouraging them to apply to you is probably the sort of lowest hanging fruit, I would say, to increase the applicant pool of women entrepreneurs. Hi, everybody. I'm Deborah Jackson. I'm the founder and CEO of Plum Alley. And Plum Alley is a company where women come to raise money for their ventures and their projects. And I come at this from a number of perspectives. I had my career for many, many years, 21 years, on Wall Street and raised money for companies, big companies and small companies. And after that experience, I became very passionate about the fact that there were these amazing women out there. They weren't always able to achieve their full potential, certainly not on Wall Street. And I was seeing it in other sectors as well. And with my background in finance, I became very um, interested in how do we move the needle? How do we get more money to these amazing women that were founding companies? Women in media, women in technology, women with consumer products. So um, what I did is I uh, got very involved in the trenches. I co-founded an accelerator program to give money to female-founded mobile companies and ran that um, effort with a number of other women. It was very focused on women building mobile tech. From there, I became an active angel investor. I've invested in a number of companies. I was a member of Golden Seeds for several years and on their screening committee. So I've seen a whole range of types of companies that are female founded and have some pretty strong feelings about what you need to do to position your company or your venture to get funding. And a couple of years ago, I founded Plum Alley, which is really focused on helping women raise money, number one, through crowdfunding, and then moving up the capital chain, um, connecting with angel investors and beyond to venture capitalists. And for those of you who were here last night, we heard the dismal statistics, less than 5% of early stage money, angel and VC funds, go to female founded companies. So that means, think about it, 95% of all dollars go to male founded companies. And that is unacceptable. That's a ratio that kills innovation. It kills the ability for women to actually have thriving companies. It means that women don't have a seat at the table. And also, women don't create the wealth from the ventures and companies they're creating. So I'm very passionate about moving that needle. It's nothing my company can do alone. We need to do this together, um, not only on women founding companies and getting money for their companies, but also the other side of the equation, we need more women to write checks. And as we know, women control the wealth in this country, but you know, not very much of it flows over to supporting female founders. So a lot of it goes to philanthropy, and I'm not saying that's not good. It's just there are some other things that we could be doing as women to further our values and to create a bigger ecosystem that has more impact in the world. Um, so the Knight Foundation has a journalism program and a media innovation program. And together, uh, we make about 30 to 40 million of new grants every year. So it's pretty sizable. Um, and we focus on innovation when it comes to tools, platforms, and processes for journalism. Um, so we don't generally tend to fund content. Um, it has to be uh, something that is new and can be reproduced or used by, uh, by other journalists to help the space um, uh, move forward. Uh, as for women, um, obviously this is, we have to be very, um, very proactive about, about um, making sure that women get their sh fair share of that money. Because if we are not really uh, vigilant about it, it doesn't get done. It just fall. This is something that, that tends to fall through the cracks in my experience. Um, so that has really translated in um, a specific effort to make sure that when we sponsor panels or discussions that there's a gender equality and that there's um, diversity represented on, on panels that we fund. Um, and also for as, as grants come, we have had a uh, focus pretty recently uh, on diversity. So we have made a few ad hoc 
grants that are specifically for that, including a great program at CUNY uh, for sending uh, kids from HBCUs and other minority um, schools to um, paid internships during the summer in New York, in places like New York Times or ProPublica or wherever they can be placed and get paid because sometimes it's hard to, to get those internships when you can afford to just take off and, and pay for all your costs. So I'm very proud of some of the, these, um, of these uh, diversity specific grants and I hope we can make more of them. And if you have any ideas about how we can go about that, I, I'm available. I'm Jake Shapiro. It's a, a privilege and an honor to be here. It's nice to uh, have gotten a secret pass uh, <laughs> to the conference that let me in. Um, I wear two hats. I'm the, um, the executive director of PRX Public Radio Exchange, and we're a distribution marketplace for stories um, in and beyond public radio, including these days podcasts, which are finally clicking in, which is great. Um, but a few years ago, um, I also helped found Matter Ventures, and Matter is a mission-driven accelerator for media startups. We're based out, uh, PRX is in Cambridge, but Matter is right in the heart of Silicon Valley um, in San Francisco. Um, and it's a five-month accelerator program focused on mission-driven media for-profit startups um, where we invest in the companies. They need to be um, early stage, usually have a product and a team. Um, our mission is to change media for good, so it's very much trying to bring um, values and principles out of journalism and public media, our roots, um, but enshrine that in some of the, the um, practices and mindsets of, of creating technology startups that we think have been a huge source of value and of growth and of impact. Um, and we've now, I think, been around for about two and a half years. We've had three classes of entrepreneurs who've come through. Um, my co-founder, Corey Ford, uh, runs the program out in San Francisco. And in terms of where we've been sourcing and trying to really help diversify the applicant pool, um, we're threading a needle because the accelerator program is not just an investment, it's actually a five-month in-person program. You have to be in San Francisco for five months with a team. Um, and that has to line up perfectly with where you are in starting your venture. And so there's a lot of hurdles and barriers to do that. Um, we're only providing $50,000 of a cash seed investment plus five months of the program and support. So a huge amount of work for us is in widening the funnel of applicants and doing a lot of the proactive outreach to make sure that we've got high caliber and diverse teams coming into our process. Some of that I've drawn from my own public media history because I think since matter is, is reaching often a creative set of industries, journalists, editors, filmmakers, others who have just been aspiring to start their own thing, um, I think we've actually had a higher quotient of certainly women applicants to matter. Um, and we've reached out to the minority consortium in public media um, and some through Christie and others um, networks that we know are in Silicon Valley. In the last class of Matter, Matter 3, 50% um, of the teams had women co-founders, which was terrific. And we just made our um, offers to teams and finalized the new class coming in. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing that it timed out with coming to this because it's two-thirds of the founders, the CEOs of the incoming class are women-led startups. Um, which I think is, which is a great, hope, hopefully a sign of things to come. And I do see that, that uh, in, in just sort of the mix of how um, the program is fared, that I think for media entrepreneurs, um, women starting new institutions, because this is part of like actually getting out of institutions, uh, Matter is a really great launching pad for those ideas. Great. So we've got a variety of different perspectives here on the panel, and what I really wanted to look at right now is really what Deborah touched on, which is the, that capital chain you mentioned from idea validation all the way through to venture capital, which will be the next panel. But let's talk a little bit about, at each of the different stages of a company's development, what are some of the different kinds of uh, funding that they should be seeking at those stages? So let's talk about the idea validation stage. What are some of the places that they might go to be able to create their minimum viable product or something that they then can go on and um, use that word scale? I, you know, what's great now is there are a number of places where a company can go to actually take those first steps down the path of creating a company. And accelerators have sprung up all over the country in the last three years, three to five years. Um, and what's really great about the accelerators is they're focused on a particular segment. So for instance, your accelerator, which is very much on media news companies, you know, that, that, and it's obviously very welcoming to female founders. I think those opportunities are really great. 
what happens in an accelerator, for those of you who may not know, is you get a small amount of seed funding, maybe 25,000, 50,000, maybe 100, and you go, it's a dedicated time where you have specific mentors that come in and help you get your company off the ground. And the first step of that is actually creating what's called the minimum viable product. What is it you're actually offering? What is the value of what you're offering? And how do you find your target customer? And all of that sounds kind of logical, but when you go through the process of really saying, <laughs> this is our product, this is how it's gonna look, this is the look and feel, this is who our customer is, here's how we're gonna market to and connect with the customer. All of that stuff is really hard, but it's the guts of creating a business. So accelerators are very good to help you go through that. And once you sort of graduate or launch from there, you should be in a position to actually approach angel, potential angel investors or venture firms, depending on where your company is and, and the opportunity. Um, I think accelerators are also very good for really thinking through your business model, your revenue model. You know, there's, there's tons of great products and ideas out there, but what separates some from others, the ones that succeed and kind of move up that capital chain, is really understanding who's going to pay for what. And that's not too dissimilar for, from what you're finding in traditional media right now with, with you know, all kinds of situations. So accelerators are very important. Um, you can now find them on the web, research them, see their track record, see who the mentors are. That's how, how to evaluate those programs. Um, also, one of the reasons that we do what's called crowdfunding on a reward basis, it's not equity in companies. It's right now just reward-based, meaning that you put up a campaign to raise some money. It gives you the opportunity to organize your thoughts and organize a campaign, put it out to the public and then people come and fund you, mostly from your network, but from a bigger group as well. And that little bit of money you can actually take before you've founded a company, and you can build a prototype of a product, or you can test market a product. Um, so I think reward-based crowdfunding is, fits very, very early on, and it's an opportunity just to test market an idea with a small amount of capital. And so it's part of the reason that Plum Alley exists. We feel it's very important to have a company that um, appreciates products that women are creating, particularly if they're for a female audience. And also we know women are very social. They tend to want to support one another, and this makes a, an easy way for you to reach out to a community. So, so those are two things I can think of that are really, really helpful very early on. So you know, then we can go up the capital mm -hmm. chain there. But I think those are accessible to everybody. Um, you know, I, I think two things I want to say is that um, when you have an idea, always think about where's the revenue model? Where, you know, how is, is this a business versus a product? And second of all, how am I, you know, get geared up to ask for money? Because at the end of the day, there are so many fabulous ideas that just, you know, die and when people are in parking lots or whatever, like just they just don't take them further because they're chicken, quite honestly, to ask for money. And it's it's hard. It's not easy. You know, you really put yourself out there and you, you know, it's 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 not a natural behavior that we have. So anyway, those are just two things. When you go into this think, number one, I have to figure out where the revenue model is. And number two, I've got to gear up to start asking for money because you're going to have to ask for money at every step of the way. Right. I think there's also perhaps even an earlier stage. I was a New Media Women Entrepreneurs, Jan Schaefer, uh, grantee. And there's grants as well as even fellowships that people use to be able to start these types of projects. Mm -hmm. So talk about some of the advantages, perhaps disadvantages of those kinds of models at the very early stages in terms of feeling your way through and why that might be a pathway for somebody seeking to develop a news organization. Can I bring up two, mm -hmm. two things that come to mind? So uh, we, we do have a small investment fund at Knight Foundation. It's very, very small, so the bar is really high to get in. But that investment uh, fund, um, the people who have gone through it have found it very useful because for leveraging other investment from a venture capitalists, because it kind of looks good if a foundation says you're doing good, there's like this added social impact side to it that some founders, some VC um, founders really like. So that's one thing. 
the second thing is that we have something called the prototype fund, uh, and this is $35,000, so smaller grant, six months. And this is just to, to build a quick and dirty prototype and test it. Uh, and then if it fails, it fails. If, if it succeeds, maybe there's, there's uh, scaling up funding or, some, uh, or, or a different path for, for this product. Uh, and people have found it very uh, useful because we, the, it's by class, it's four times a year, and the classes go through human-centered design training at the, at the beginning of it, so they're able to, um, to build a, a prototype that is really answering a real, a real problem and not a problem that doesn't exist, which is a pro uh, uh, an issue with a lot of products. So just keep in mind prototype fund and our investment fund. So I was going to add, um, you know, this is sort of to piggyback on what Marie said. We see a lot of companies, um, you know, we've seen hundreds of companies since we first got started, and we see um, lots of companies that are solutions in search of a problem. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that's really great about things like fellowships is that you can test all of the assumptions about the problem you think you're going to solve in what is generally a fairly low risk environment. Okay. Typically it's not money you're paying back. You sort of have some structure around you when you're doing that initial testing. It can be very lonely. If you're trying to do something new, presumably there are going to be a lot of people that say that would never work. And you're like, of course, because it's new. And so um, if it works, someone will be doing it already. And so I think um, I really like thinking of sourcing capital in a layered way, starting with a fellowship to sort of have some community. It's lonely, and so community is helpful, especially if you're in a cohort. Same is true with accelerators. Um, as a way of like free money to test your assumptions because I guarantee you your initial assumptions will be wrong. Um, and this sort of crowdfunding piece of it also feels really helpful because you're actually testing audience. So the thing about this path is that each step is sort of reinforcing of the other. When we look at deals that are too early for us because they haven't proven audience and they can say, well actually, we've just run this crowdfunding campaign, even if they haven't raised a lot of money, they're actually showing that there's hundreds of people or thousands of people that are saying, yes, I'm interested in this service and would pay money at the point where it comes out. And then for the accelerator programs that you can participate in, um, there is both this community aspect because you're going through it with a bunch of other people that are in the same boat, answering a lot of the same kinds of questions, but they also really force you to get out of the building. So it's not about putting together the perfect plan or having all of your ducks in a row, it is actually getting out into the street and asking people what they think about the thing you've built. Um, from the perspective on the question about women, one thing I would say is that we see lots of women that are um, incredibly well prepared, um, but have a lower tolerance for things that are messy. And I think that um, in the startup world, one thing we as a community can do is increase our tolerance for the mess that is building a startup. Again, the initial assumptions are gonna be wrong. People aren't gonna want the product. They're gonna want this other thing that you thought was an add-on, but it's actually the one single feature that they're interested in and would pay money for. So I think, again, to go back to this, um, it may not be a ladder, maybe it's a jungle gym, fellowship plus crowdfunding campaign to, do, to uh, prove audience, go to an acceler accelerator program to actually figure out how to build your business model then go to angel funding, that's sort of where New Media Ventures comes in. Sometimes we turn people away because they're too early or refer them to accelerators to kind of work it out. Um, and then we're all kind of talking to each other. So the more noise you can create in the ecosystem around your product from all of these different sources, the higher the likelihood that you'll get the money at the, kind, the right kind of money at the time that you need it. I think there were a couple of things that we talked about um, in our phone call that were really barriers to women. Um, the idea of women as solopreneurs versus sourcing that team and the rest of the team and trying to go at it alone for a long time. Can you talk to that aspect of, of the importance of team and how to be able to develop a team to be more successful and sustainable? When we've been um, thinking about what we're looking for in a, a team of Find a Matter, and it's actually an exception that we ex would bring in a solo founder, because mostly because you've got five months and you have to hit the ground running and try to build something, and it's just hard to do alone. And we wouldn't want to have you spinning your wheels in that process. Um, and when we think about the things that we're looking for in terms of testing these hypotheses over like what's possible, 
Um, we think about uh, desirability, feasibility, and viability of your idea. And desirability being who's your customer, uh, the feasibility being the technical dimension, and the viability being the business model. Mm -hmm. But we also think about these roles of what a team should be. And in our case, because we're media, we've sort of added one. Um, but we describe it quickly as a hacker, a hustler, this is actually the business person, a designer, and a storyteller. Um, and it's not that those necessarily have to be four people, but those four kind of skill sets need to be represented. Um, and it's, hard, it's rare to find one person who has them all. Um, and we also don't really have the, in the span or the capacity of the accelerator to do the team building, to do the matchmaking. This is a big need. Um, and we have various sort of partners or other places to look for, all the meetups in town to sort of do the find a co-founder, but it's really hard. And of course, uh, the biggest gap is the technical co-founder, the elusive technical yeah. co-founder, the, the coder, uh, the hacker, um, who's gonna be um, on your team. Um, we actually, in this past, this new class coming in, we actually do have two solo female founder CEOs, which is, a, so it's a big exception for us. In both cases, um, we felt strongly that not only had they demonstrated that they have teams that they've actually assembled and are very good at pulling in resources, um, had a lot of confidence that landing in San Francisco, they'd be able to capitalize on their own networks and ones that we could bring to actually pull people in. Mm -hmm. Um, but it also managed, you know, as a solo founder, to build that minimally viable prototype um, and show that it actually could, could go. So I do think that team element, especially in a compressed time frame of an accelerator, is critical. Um, and I think that it is an additional challenge for journalists or editors, people coming out of more of a content layer. They're not starting, and you know, this is not an accelerator for like cloud computing infrastructure. You know, it's not like starting mm -hmm. from a technical layer. It's usually starting from a story perspective which I think a lot of our female founders have had a strong storytelling element, mm -hmm. and then getting the technical piece is always a challenge. I'd, I'd like to add a couple of thoughts to that, um, having run an accelerator program. What, sometimes um, entrepreneurs or founders think, okay, I need to assemble a team, so they go about that, and you know, it's kind of hard to do it if you're not just right out of college, because many times you've got other commitments or obligations. So, you know, sometimes there is this pressure to form a team, and what I see is, in most cases, those teams don't work. Um, and, and you can imagine, when you're starting something new, you really need to have one founder that has the vision. It's okay to get other people on board and to supplement your own, you know, skill set or whatever, but I've seen so many cases where you have like a collection of three to four to five people and they come in, they go through the accelerator and they're getting ready to, you know, actually present to funders and you say, okay, well, who's, who's the CEO? The person on the other side of the table is going to want to know who's driving the bus. And they go, well, we didn't quite sort that out yet. And, this and you know, you, <laughs> but this person does this, I do this. Okay, but who's driving the bus? And at the end of the day, you need one person. So. In this audience, the, the women that have an idea and say, you know what, I want to do a company that does X, or I want to do X, own it, own it. You are the founder, and you're going to drive it forward. And obviously, you can't do it alone, so you've got to get maybe a technical mm -hmm. partner. And there's a lack of technical people that want to be co-founders. Generally, the only ones that are available have, you know, aren't that good. So. <laughs> I mean, sometimes if you're if you're kind of in the know and in the network, you can find people. But it's really difficult. Even big companies can't find really, you know, an adequate staff on the tech side. So, what you can do, you can contract out. You don't have to have it as a co-founder or person in your team. When you're doing the minimum viable product, you can pay an outside firm a small amount of money to do a simple prototype. So, don't think you have to have all the pieces of the puzzle in place day one. Um, you know, obviously the more you can have, the better, but there's also in, not just in, you know, startup situations, but companies, early stage companies, look at some of the big ones, you know, Twitter, or Facebook. The founding team, when that company was off the ground, they had problems. So, you know, when you, when you connect with the founder, it's like, you know, it's more than a marriage because you, you know, you're kind of stuck with this person, and, and, and it's all about business. And you find out things, you know, when you're going down the path together. Mm -hmm. at, at night, if if there is not a, a strong technical skill in the core team, it raises a red a red flag for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do see a lot of journalists who are uh, taking uh, developers as short order order cooks, right? It's like, oh, I'll just uh, contract that out, right? 
but at the end of the day, it's a, such a uh, iterative process that you, you just need to have that person all, all along with those skills. And maybe that person is the, the driver, maybe. maybe That's even the yeah. best case scenario. I would also add, you know, something that Shazna had said on the last panel, which was always be recruiting. That is so true. It may not be for the position you have now, but again, you may have an opportunity in the future and be disciplined about it. One of the entrepreneurs this morning was talking about how she had gone through four designers um, before she got to the right person. And I think that that feels very true for lots of companies in our portfolio. And I'd suggest you be disciplined about who you bring onto the team. Demand excellence, the kind of excellence you demand from yourself. Um, team is the single most important factor that we look at um, when we're financing startups because we presume that people are going to pivot their product um, after we invest. And so if people don't have a team that's going to be able to weather those kinds of challenges, um, it is, again, a red flag for us, regardless of what the team um, looks like. One advantage I think that people in this room actually have in terms of recruiting is that if there are people here with a journalism background or a storytelling background, the thing that you have is being able to communicate your passion and a vision in a way that is actually better than other people trying to start companies. And so I would maybe think of that as a real asset when it comes to recruiting people. And so if you're looking at a startup, are you going to fund a content company that's strictly content, or must it have that technical component to it or something that's scalable? And we had this conversation in our telephone conversation about this, really about, you know, are you a local bakery or are you a Panera? Uh, something that can scale, and that those are two totally different pathways, none wrong or right on either side, but really looking at what your product is and trying to make that determination. Do you find that people go through the processes that you all, um, uh, have available to them and find that they answer that question and say, no, I'm not really a Panera, I'm not really in the right place. Can you speak to a little bit more about some of those questions, those very early questions about who am I and what is the kind of business I'm in and what's really what's fundable? I, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, we we uh, debate this a lot. Um, so, you know, we do get a fair number of applications from pure content companies. You know, we are a publisher. Um, and essentially, you know, we've got a business model that's gonna be about, you know, a funnel of social traffic into a subscription thing, or we've got a ad model. Um, and we've had a few actually that we thought were a fit, not just because, not, not because they were gonna be just a small successful business, but we felt that there was something either replicable or a learning that would be had. Part of our purpose for Matter is that we feel it's actually a learning laboratory for our, for our partners, for the larger community. Um, so not every single element of the portfolio has to be potential venture scale. Um, but it is a venture fund, and we have limited partner investors who are expect some sort of return, and it has that kind of pressure. And I feel like we're still in a world where there's a gap between mm -hmm. that kind of venture path, which is not for everybody, um, and pure venture uh, capitalist funds, you know, have a pretty high uh, expectation. Um, and then things that, you know, pejoratively the venture capitalists would call lifestyle businesses, which is one of those terms that drives me crazy when I hear it, because that's actually the majority of successful, profitable businesses would be like lifestyle, lifestyle. businesses that just don't happen to have billion dollar IPOs at the, at the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like there's actually a really interesting moment where many of these pure, more pure publishing and content companies, given how much distribution has been solved in certain ways elsewhere on platforms, can actually make a really credible case to at least start that we're gonna you know, demonstrate our, our appeal, we're gonna demonstrate our model, and we're gonna grow and be successful without necessarily promising to be you know, the next giant publisher. Deborah? I think it, it, it really comes down to um, the vision of the founder. Like, what is it they want to do? What is it they want to offer to the world? So it, whatever you're, and it kind of has to come organically mm -hmm. for something you care about and you have passion and you can see an opportunity out there. And so, and that you can't artificially create. So once you have that, then you can say, okay, this is what it is. How big is this? Like. Could this be a billion dollar company? But to answer that question, you really have to think about it as a business. Okay, here's my product, here's my customer, and here's how I'm gonna get my customer, and this is how much they'll pay. And if you can answer those questions, you will see in a business model, well, I think I can make money at this. The market's this big, or maybe it's that big. So it kind of comes organically from whatever your idea is, and that's the value of accelerators and some books out there and courses you can take, like to really get your head around that. And once you know what you have, 
then you know, okay, this is how much capital I have to raise, and this is the growth potential. And it becomes self-evident. And it's, it's not like you can day one say, okay, I'm gonna create a billion dollar company. Like, what's the best idea? And you, th the inspiration, the ideas, the vision really has to be organic because you know what? It's, being an entrepreneur is so hard. There are days when you think you're onto something and then the next week you think, this is a disaster, this is nothing. And the only thing that keeps you going is that, that passion, that sort of commitment, that idea that you see that no one else in the world sees. And if you don't have that, you're gonna, you know, at the, at some point, fizzle out. Because it, it's, being an entrepreneur is humbling. I mean, I, I had both a corporate America and then I became an entrepreneur. And I'm telling you, it is, it is so hard because it is, there's no formula. You have to be willing every day to say, I was wrong about that hunch or that assumption. You know what? We got to move here. And if you're not comfortable with rapid iteration and change and, and realizing, like I had a couple of ideas in my company along the way that were okay, they weren't great. And it was so hard for me to say, oh, that's just okay, it's not great, and we got to find a great something. Mm -hmm. So we didn't change the vision, the mission, we changed the tactics and strategy and came up with different products. So it's, it, that's kind of the life of the entrepreneur. And so you just, it's, it's, I can't, it's hard to describe it. It's an organic thing. It's something you know. It's something you see. Well, you've kind of touched a little bit on, and I believe in the last panel, it's just about women as entrepreneurs. But women as entrepreneurs, we've seen from the statistics from last night and today that there is some uh, pattern matching going on. Uh, so whether you want to call it stereotyping, whether you want to call it pattern matching, that people will give to people they know or they give to people that look like them. Um, and so when I look at structures like an accelerator and I look at structurally how it's set up, requiring you in many cases to pick yourself up and move to a certain location to be able to be there for a certain amount of time, are those structures designed as impediments to women and how can we change those structures? That's been a huge, so we knew setting up matter that <coughs> we were forcing um, barriers that would absolutely be problematic, not just for women, but for lots of people for whom the resources to move, to uproot your life, you know, come to San Francisco, spend five months on this thing on, on low money. Um, and it's been part of our thinking all along that we would design it as the starting point, but not the end point for where matter's value would be both in terms of saying there's other participation in the community and learnings of matter. So we have both the mentor network and partner network. We run boot camps for others who are not actually in the accelerator. So I think there's a broader mesh that can happen. But also trying to think through, and we have not solved this, um, how um, a dispersed participation or a non-physical accelerator could work. It's a real challenge because a huge, we put a huge premium on the actual cultural experience of being in that space for five months um, right in the heart of Soma in San Francisco, and there's just a tremendous value in that. Um, but there's no doubt, and we've seen it, that that, like when I was saying threading the needle, the timing of being able to pull that off with the individual circumstances is really hard. But, you know, we have, like, one of the people coming into this coming class was originally from Chile, has been living in Tel Aviv, is uprooting her family and her life to come out to do this, because it is a certain, I mean, we are setting this bar that's really high, it's a huge leap of faith to start a company. And one of the reasons we wanted to do a for-profit accelerator is that there's a lot of project experimentation funding in our foundation, you know, funded in the nonprofit sector that doesn't have that leap of faith discipline and true crucible moment of like starting a company. And so we did set that high, but recognizing that it actually has all these structural implications which we're still wrestling with. So we've wrestled with this question quite a bit um, because of this new fund that we started where we're gonna make $50,000 investments. Um, we have been pretty committed to not starting an accelerator because there are so many out there um, and are really asking ourselves the question of what is it that we are trying to help people do that they couldn't otherwise do on their own. As Jake pointed out, a huge value of being in residence at an accelerator is the community. And so if you don't have that, what are the other things that you're trying to um, sort of add on through your investment? And in many ways for us, it's about making that investment um, a better investment and to, to help ensure the success of the company at this early stage. What, what actually do we have any control over? And knowing that uh, some of the existing structures might be barriers to 
again, not just women, but working parents, for example, lo lots of different kinds of people, um, more traditional structures are actually, uh, yeah, huge barriers. So we've been asking ourselves, are there other things that we could do, non-resident things perhaps, but even our latest idea, this is again super new, again we're going to try to experiment with it, is something like a testing pool. One of the biggest um, challenges that we've seen with companies, again, is this solution in search of a problem. People not actually understanding who their paying customer is going to be. And as we're diligencing the investments, we're often talking to people who are the potential customers. And so is there a way that we could set up a community of people that are the customers of the software companies that we are trying to actually invest in. The benefit to the company is that they're getting a direct line into potential customers that would otherwise take them layers of bureaucracy to get to the decision maker. And for us, it's reducing our time in diligence. And so um, that is a way that we think we can add value um, from an investment perspective that is not requiring people to be resident someplace, but maybe has some of the benefits of what people look for in an accelerator. I think it's an open question, though. I think it's sort of like, um, there, there's lots of things we could try, existing things don't work. I haven't seen a ton of things out there that feel like they're really nailing it, to tell you the truth. I, I just want to comment on that, too, having founded an accelerator program for women building mobile tech. and. Um, our experience with that, and part of the reason we shut that down, quite honestly, is that we could see amazing women that could not participate because yeah. they had families or children they could not relocate. And so what you see, the demographic is kind of young people right out of college, you know, very few, you know, and, and I think there's some really interesting ideas springing up. I think we're seeing like the next generation of accelerators, which are about doing more programming online, um, there's an accelerator that just was founded in Boulder, Colorado that's female focused and they have women coming for a week, then they do remote work for a couple months and then they come back at the end. So, so that's, I think people are experimenting, they're trying to yeah. solve this problem. Um, the other thing, the, the other thing to, if you're looking at accelerators, keep in mind that most accelerators like Techstars and Y Combinator, they're focused on getting their companies funding, funded at the end of the program. And honestly, that was another thing we learned in our accelerator. There's no magic to a company being ready after three months or six months. Sometimes companies take longer. So in a, many of the accelerator programs, halfway through, they switch from working on your product to, okay, your pitch to investors. And many, many companies are just not ready for that. So, you know, with all these things, you have to be a bit of captain of your own ship. And if you're not in an urban area or not where you can uh, participate in, in an accelerator, there are other programs. There are books, Stanford University offers entrepreneur programs. It may not be specifically news media, but the principles are the same. That yeah. last point also goes to your um, earlier question about lifestyle businesses versus venture businesses, mm -hmm. because typically, at the demo day of an accelerator, who is in the room are investors that are looking for this kind of massive return. And so just being really clear on what you think you're building from the beginning and then having that relate to what kind of external financing you might be looking for, knowing that you're building that kind of a business and therefore you want that kind of investor, or knowing that you're building a sort of small profitable business, maybe not hockey stick, but profitable, and looking for a different kind of investor might dictate uh, sort of the kinds of programs you participate earlier on. Uh, one of the other um, categories of investor that we've started to really understand better and I think is interesting for this group, um, outside of straight venture capitalists who absolutely are like that kind of narrow vision in on what a return might be, um, are strategic media company investors. Um, so, for example, for Matter itself, the fund was raised from uh, Knight Foundation, but also KQED, um, and now we have got some new limited partners who are major media companies who are investing in Matter, not because they're expecting the giant return. Um, they, they like and appreciate and are sort of used to the fact that it's structured as an investment, but they're mainly looking because they want access to understand early stage entrepreneurship, what's happening, disrupting their main businesses, so they want to see what's being built. They want to have the, the sort of practice and culture of design thinking, product building, influence their own company cultures. So I think there's actually a growing appetite for legacy and incumbent major media companies to be very interested in investing in at a different different lens, different metric, 
uh, media startups. And I think that actually puts everybody starting those companies in a much different position. We also spoke a little bit in our call about specifically women as entrepreneurs and some of the challenges, i.e. issues, that we may have in terms of asking for money. And Deborah said, get ready for the million dollar ask. What are some of the things that we can do to prepare uh, women entrepreneurs, women founders, to be able to talk the talk and be in the places and find and meet the people? And let's get that back to plan A. How do they get into the spaces to meet the people where they can find money, besides being here? Well, the good thing about um, the internet now is you can do the research. So you can you know, do a search just on angel investors. There's some female-founded angel investing clubs that you can get information about. Um, but I think the, the issue before that is deciding that you, you do need to raise outside money because raising outside money, think about this, is not a business model. So plenty of companies can exist perfectly well without raising any outside capital or, or a small amount. So, but, but first understand your business and then one of the things I see with, with, with a lot of women is that it has to be perfect before they go ahead. So they really have to understand every aspect of their business plan and every, uh, every other every aspect of their product. And you know what? You, you can't ever be get it all. So there's a standard. It's sort of for me like when I had children and my house cleaning standard went down and I was okay with it. It was like, okay, I'm just never gonna get to that. That's fine if there are fuzzballs in the corner. It's the same thing in a company. Like realize it's never gonna be perfect. Just get comfortable with, with it's good enough. And the good enough for most women is really, really good. Mm -hmm. So Definitely. just, you know, just kind of loosen up a bit about it and just go for it. And, and, and don't take no personally. Don't take rejection personally. I know it's very hard. We all feel it. But it's going to happen. It's the nature of the business. And, you know, what happens, what I see with women, the first couple of no's from an outside investor or somebody didn't like their product, they're devastated. And then after a while, they kind of get that thick skin. They go, damn it, I'm not giving up and then they go back. But just know that's part of the territory. Like just brace yourself and do it and just tell that little voice that, you know, shut up mm -hmm. and just do it. Well, I think we have uh, about 10 minutes for questions. So we'd like to open it up to some questions. So see, uh, let's start in the very back there where the microphone is and work our way forward and yeah. over here. Hi, uh, my name is Sue Green and I just had a question about, uh, we talked about diversity in trying to reach out and getting more diverse uh, women uh, that are applying for these. Um, how do you, as someone who's diverse, apply for a program without saying I'm diverse? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that I would just like to be judged on my work and not on the color of my skin. I'd like to just uh, mention, there was uh, Paul Graham, actually about a day ago, came out with startup survival rules. And one of his was, uh, you make what you measure. And I think as we began to brainstorm solutions for this panel, um, just as we're pointing to media companies, just as we're pointing to Silicon Valley tech companies and asking them to be transparent about who's on their boards, who's making decisions, how much money is going to women and people of color, communities that are underrepresented, we should be asking our foundations and other different types of funders to be just as transparent in giving those numbers, because if we're measuring it, then people will pay attention to it and focus on it and demand change in those areas. So I think we need to ask for the same kind of transparency um, from various funders to make that scorecard known. Other thoughts? I was just gonna say, just, just that like, I really appreciate the question. Like, it's a really hard, nobody wants to be the diversity candidate, right? Everybody is here like on their own merits and ama doing amazing work. Um, I, my sense is that at some point, uh, those of us and the communities that are pulling the purse strings will actually realize there is a hugely undervalued opportunity that we are just missing, both a financial opportunity um, and an opportunity to make impact, and that will come from financing entrepreneurs that are finding problems that you never even thought about because they didn't resemble the problems you thought to identify yourself. So um, 
you know, both you shouldn't have to do that, and uh, hopefully we will learn by example as well. And then over here. Hello. My name is Amy Ferris Rotman. I have a question for all of you. I mean, lots of what you've been talking about is how to get money for profit for businesses. Um, and I wondered if you could flip that a bit. Um, I'm a journalist and I'm interested in my creating a project which is um, which will produce, uh, create absolutely no money at all. I mean, but it's for the common good. It's for social change. It's to train Afghan female journalists. Um, and so could you give a bit of advice about how to seek out money in that framework? I mean, it, it was addressed a little bit on the panel, and I think previously today. But I mean, for those kinds of projects that are addressing, uh, you know, something that is not served by the market, it's literally like a market failure or an opportunity. That is exactly why, hopefully, for foundations like Ford exist. Um, and I think what an exciting thing is that we now have some of these crowdfunding tools that I think are still in an early stage of evolution that also find a source of non-traditional capital that don't have some equity investment, expected return, or managed like debt. Um, and I would hope that both between government, um, philanthropy, private sector donors, and crowdfunding, that things that have a high mission purpose and hopefully an effective path are exactly what should be funded outside of the for-profit market. Mm -hmm. There's still a big need and a big role for all of those. Yeah, yeah so and I would say let's talk later. Mm -hmm. So it's finding those <laughs> social entrepreneurs in those spaces <laughs> that lo are looking for that triple bottom line and really focusing in on those. We fund both nonprofits and for profits. We say we're legal entity agnostic, so we don't actually care whether you're a for profit or a nonprofit, just that you have chosen the legal vehicle that is most appropriate for your actual mission. Um, and one other thing I would suggest more specifically is if you see projects that you admire, go talk to those founders, see who funded them. That's usually the way that I find new funders. Question right here. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Jumana. Um, I'm co founder of Visualizing Impact. And one of the factors that's rarely spoken about and that puts, I believe, the highest pressure on founders, co-founders, is um, the estimation of time. High ambition with high pressure that things should, led by examples of others, happen quicker than is a, tr than a true timeline. Uh, Deborah, you spoke very uh, briefly about the three months or six months and whether a project can really mature within that period. And startups are usually said to happen within three years. And I'm speaking to people who only made it after six or seven years. If you can speak about the time factor to and, sure. and how to, to bring that into the conversation to ease people's minds and have them plan better and not rush into things. My own experience is that companies take a minimum of five to eight years until you can really see how good they are. And like accelerator programs and all these early stage efforts, it's just, you know, the first year, first couple of years. And that's maybe when you develop your product, refine your idea, get it out to market, test it. Then, once you have a product, in 99% of the cases, then you have to find your market and market to them and get them to sign on. And that's that kind of longer tail. Mm -hmm. And then along that way, you find, oh, you've got to iterate your product, or here's a better opportunity. or So, you know, we all hear about the headline stories and about the companies like Uber and, you know, just kind of got on the scene and now they're billion dollar companies and they're unicorns. And, and you know what? That is, that's like winning the lottery. It, the percentage is like winning the lottery. It just really is not how it works. And it's, it, creates the wrong expectation on the part of both investors and entrepreneurs that somehow magically they can do something in a couple of years. They'll have, you know, this mega company. And people will be throwing money at them and they can do an IPO. It's just, if, if you think of the, you know, millions of companies that have been created and, you know, you can put on a couple of hands or maybe now three hands, <laughs> you know, the unicorns. And that's what we hear about. But nobody hears about all these other companies that are, great companies and in year three and four and slogging along and you know maybe they don't get their next infusion of capital so they fizzle out you know who knows but that's not the norm so just think about your company and your idea and how you're going to build it brick by brick by brick and and if i can add real quickly 
we funded uh, local nonprofit news uh, online newspapers, um, places like Texas Tribune was on one of the more successful and famous, but smaller places. And we, we give them startup funding, but that's it. I mean, there's no, it, we don't fund uh, operation, uh, operational expenses. So after two, three years, you're hustling and you're selling advertisement, like you're a small business. So it's, you know, it's, it's exactly what you're describing as the anti-Uber yeah. scenario, is that you, it's just your life now, it's your business and, and people are doing good. They're, they're still you know, fragile, it's been, uh, some of them have, have only uh, started up um, uh, four or five years ago. So it's still kind of shaky, but, but they're still around and they're making it. Great, we still have time for the questions. Yes, you. Hi, um, I was struck by the comment or question about the speed with which an accelerator moves um, an entrepreneur through the development to launch and to raise funding. So there's a lot of understanding and sense of the ecosystem relative to what's ahead, the investment, the sort of rocketing people out into the future. I, I run a, uh, an organization where over the last six years we've created within public media, public broadcasting, radio and television system, um, an incubator well, we've launched 18 experiments over the last seven years. And what's unusual and interesting is, you know, we have, um, we give them up to $150,000 and a year to really take the time within <coughs> the institutional structure of public broadcasting. So deeply infused with the mission inside of the radio and television stations led by independent entrepreneurial women for the most part. Um, so what's interesting and what I'm trying to think about now is one question for you all is in terms of your ecosystem, do you have, what, we, what we're doing seems unique. And what I'm trying to understand is are there others in your field who are feeding you? Who are, who are your farm teams? And if so, what's your relationship to them? Because there's a certain hurdle. So we've had several of our experiments um, you know, Jake is familiar with this, you know, move into for-profit accelerators. And it's an interesting and um, question that many of us within my industry are, are thinking about as these barriers are dissolving. What, who are we relative to that when so we've I'd made- I'd like to speak to your farm team because I yeah. think there have been two programs, one funded by, by Ford, the new U Unity program that has seated many of the speakers that you've seen here. Uh, women entrepreneurs with fairly small grants of $20,000, the new media women's entrepreneur. Uh, those are both foundation funded programs that really need to be renewed in order to continue the farm team that moves these young women to the next level. Um, we've seen a decline in foundation funding specifically around not only women, but women of color. And so if we don't have these opportunities, these competitions and farm teams, um, we are going to lose the pipeline that we've already built, first of all. Second of all, um, I'm at a higher ed institution where we are also looking at media entrepreneurship as part of our ecosystem and building media entrepreneurship. We are creating pathways and farm teams, basically, of students who then can come out of school and go into accelerator programs, perhaps when they are a little bit more flexible geographically, um, although they might come out with quite a bit of debt. But uh, there might be flexible geographically to take advantage of some of these opportunities. So I think those are two key structural changes. The, the competitions that we've had in place that really need to remain funded, as well as higher education. Um, CUNY and others that are doing programs like this that are feeding people into this ecosystem. Those are great pathways to build that out. In the back here. This should be a fairly quick question. Is there any support for uh, women whose companies have failed to help them get back into the saddle? And I don't mean with a same company, I'm talking about a new company. You know, you hear all the time, oh, fail fast, right? It, well, it hurts like hell. Having closed one company, it takes me a while to get back on the saddle. Things are going gangbusters now, but I can tell you it's very difficult to just shake it off. Uh, and I'm just wondering if there's anything out there. You know, you, now you've got the new fail conference, right, for that sort of thing. But is there anything geared toward women entrepreneurs? Because I think they take it, it's harder for them, I think, than men, particularly at this point when there's so many, you know, less of us. I don't know of anything specifically focused on, you know, 
chance number two or something post women, uh, post a failure of a company. One thing I would suggest is like, there's like so many people in the same boat. I always think in Silicon Valley, your badge of honor is like your first company failing or something like that. So one thing I would suggest is at FailCon is just to do like a, you know, meet up, like just raise your hand and say, who wants to talk about this? You would be shocked at the number of people who would come out of the woodwork by just naming it as a thing. Um, it may be that other people have, have heard of something else, but uh, when when these kinds of things come up, it sounds like you know that's a great idea. I would I would definitely go to that meetup if someone suggested it at a convening like this, or even at drinks tonight. Just say you know meet by the meet by the drinks table, um, and I think you'd be surprised at how many people you found. So we're gonna wrap up here. I just want to give everybody a chance, one quick solution to solving the women media entrepreneurship pipeline, uh, starting from the end and coming this way. So just one quick solution that you can take or implement and give away, take away uh, to actually solving this issue. Uh, find community. Uh, find other people that are like you and uh, work on your stuff together, even if it's um, even if they're different companies. Raise a little bit of money and go. Uh, be mindful and intentional about promoting women, and make the men around you be mindful and intentional as well. I'd say use your current institution, if you're at one, as a springboard to pursue your own idea. Great. Please join me in welcoming and thanking our wonderful panel we've had this afternoon. Thank you for all of your questions as well.